Welcome to episode 103 of Radio 815, the podcast dedicated to examining the work of writer director J.J. Abrams and his greater Bad Robot universe. I'm your host for this week. My name is Marcelo Inestroza, joined as always by my fellow co host, Matt Crandall. And on today's edition, we'll be talking about Fringe episodes four through five. First up in that batch is the episode entitled Do Sheep Dream of Electric Sheep? Matt, what do you dream of? I definitely don't dream of stegosaurs brains being in their butts which is something that walter comes across in this episode as we start to investigate further into what exactly these shape-shifting sons of bitches are because the episode opens with a guy buying lemonade from a couple of girls on the street and he seems like a nice normal guy till he's in a car wreck and he goes to the to the hospital and Philip Broyles is one of his best buddies, and then we start to realize that this guy is actually a shapeshifter because we see the mercury blood, and Newton shows up, shoots him in the face to make sure that they can't get any information because this guy, being a personal friend of Broyles that had been replaced, obviously has some sort of high security clearance and definitely a lot more information that would have been terrible to get in the wrong hands so a lot of this episode is us trying to recover his memories and find out what his mission was because he is from the other side and he is working for our government so i thought that that was really interesting but also the other super interesting part of this episode is we do get to see walter in action as the head of massive dynamic So I like that when we first run into Walter at the beginning of this, he is tripping balls and he's giving a speech to a bunch of his new employees and he's about to take off his pants when Peter comes in and says, hold up, we got we got some investigating to do. So I thought that was a lot of fun. The thing that I loved about this episode is that we've been told that the shapeshifters are nothing more than inorganic robots they're sort of a hybrid kind of a deal but i thought that the writers did a great job of filling in the history of the shapeshifters in order for the shapeshifters to achieve their mission on our side whatever that mission is they get feelings for the individuals that they are paired up with that's interesting because at the start of this episode Full Olivia and Peter are having a date. Just before they leave the restaurant, Olivia goes into the bathroom and she just takes a moment and she goes, she just breathes really deep and sort of profound. Full Olivia is a bitch. There's no denying that. But I postulated in the past that Full Olivia has feelings. So this episode really goes a long way into saying that Full Olivia is a soldier doing what she has to do, but she is not devoid of having feelings. This episode did a great job of illustrating that Full Olivia has some feelings and she is going to have to start dealing with that. I really liked all those themes that the writers um, hit on for this episode. When Newton and her have the talk, she yells at him for screwing up because things have gone sideways but he also calls her out and says you're not focused and you're not going to succeed unless you also get your shit together which is kind of him passing the buck but that is also the moment where then she realizes like she's she has some sort of emotions going on that she has to tamp down to just get done what needs to be done but the main point that they keep hitting is when we find out that Broyles' friend this senator at some point was replaced and his wife didn't notice And whatever, even Peter says, like, how could they have not noticed that someone was replaced by someone else? So, of course, we're screaming because the dramatic irony being that someone, I can't remember if it's Walter, or somebody says, well, they probably noticed some differences, but that's not where you would go to. So you start to gloss over them. So you wouldn't think like, oh, they're acting out of character. They must be someone else. 
And we've already seen many times where Peter has kind of given Olivia a look because she's faux Olivia, because she's acting out of character and he is not jumping to that conclusion. Even when it is staring him in the face in this episode, he keeps overlooking it because that's not where your mind would immediately go. And we know that later this is going to be a whole can of worms that's going to get opened up. The how could you not know it wasn't me part of it. And as you mentioned, the other shapeshifter that we meet is a sleeper agent who has been here for, I think he said five or seven years that he hasn't heard Newton from Newton in that amount of time. So we know that they have been planting agents for a long time for this war. And this guy has actually started a family. So he is a police officer, but he has a wife and a son. And this is not a son that was somebody else's son that he stepped in and shapeshift into this police officer. This is actually his son because he's been here for seven years and the kid's only like four. So we know that he was there so long that he is very reluctant to actually do the mission that he was there in the first place for, because after you're undercover for so long, you start to just believe it. And if you get complacent and actually have a good life, this is something they would often hit on 24 or Homeland, where we would have some sort of sleeper agent that came to the U.S., started a new life, and then when it was finally time for them to do the thing, they had already been comfortable in the the fake life. So I thought that was an interesting dynamic as we are calling out still this how could people not have known, but also seeing that these soldiers, even though they know that they are there for this universe war, some of them it's been so long that maybe they don't even know what they're really fighting for at this point. And I thought that the cop that does eventually go through with it and he ends up getting killed by Newton when Newton realizes that he was not going to end up being able to kill the family to cover his tracks, I thought was just an interesting emotional layer to this episode amongst all the weird stuff of the hard drive in the shapeshifter's spine and wiring up the dude's butt to try and get the memories back and all that kind of stuff. You mentioned that somebody says, you know, how could they not notice that somebody who said that was Peter? But all throughout that scene, I was just screaming my head off because he says it. He says it right to full Olivia's face. He goes, ever since you came back from the other side, you're just different, but better. I mean, the damage that he's going to do to his relationship with our Olivia is going to be astronomical. When we find out that the shapeshifter who gets in the car accident at the beginning of the episode is someone who was replacing somebody in a high position of power within our government. So I'm beginning to think uh, Walter Net wants to somehow infect our world. And the way that he wants to do that is by placing individuals or placing uh, shapeshifters in high positions of government in our um, universe destroy his reality so our reality would be the only one left. Maybe that's something. And I did find it interesting when we do investigate that Van Horn's office and Peter's like, it's us. And at, at first Olivia's like, huh? And he's like, he's got files on all of us. And he starts going through and well, I think what he says is, it's you. And she's like, what? <laughs> Thinking that she's been added and he's like, and me and Walter. And so I, I like that we don't know what, well, certainly we being team fringe on this side, don't know why these shapeshifters are investigating them. We know because they were trying to get recon and information so that they could try and plant sleeper agents within the organization in some way. So I thought that was really interesting. We definitely see Folivia up to a lot of bad shit as they do apprehend Newton. She double crosses us and keeps the disc and says that she doesn't have it. And then she visits Newton in prison and gives him this little chip thing that he then eats and dies. So she gives him the suicide capsule that takes him off the board. And it's so frustrating to us knowing how close our team was to retrieving the data they needed to figuring out a lot of this shapeshifters plan only to have the mole really screw us over and then literally screw Peter Bishop at the end, 
to try and, you know, as we can start to kind of connect the dots because of that earlier scene where Newton said, you're not doing the mission right and you're going to fail unless you man up and get this done. We start to wonder, oh, no, this her seducing Peter is definitely a key part of the mission. To what end? What are they trying to accomplish here? And alarm bells for where we could be heading definitely start to go off by the time this episode wraps. That scene where Fo Olivia visited Newton in jail. And the reason why I like that scene so much is because it starts off with, you know, Olivia walking through the prison. But the director does something very, very cool by showing Olivia's eye line through the little socket that the door has that Newton is behind. Fringe, for the most part, really doesn't do flashy camera movements. They kind of do sometimes, but this is the first episode that I've really noticed shot selection from a particular director that's on the crew. And I thought that was such a cool way to film that conversation. Yeah, definitely. I feel like the way that the show is generally filmed is a lot more procedural, meat and potatoes, very simple. But every once in a while, we get a few visual stylistic flourishes here and there. And a shot like that was definitely one of them that stood out in an episode like this. We move on to the second episode that we're going to talk about this week, entitled Amber 31422. I always love to point out that we're now in Vancouver, and if there was anything more Vancouver than putting the Ashmores in your episode, I don't know what it is, because those guys always pop up on any WBCW Fox show that shoots in Vancouver. And this episode, we are now on the other side. So last episode, we were all in our universe. This is entirely the other universe. As we, so far this season, are establishing this flip-flop thing where one episode our universe other universe our universe other universe and i dig it so it gives us more insight into the other side this episode's mystery of the week that the fringe team is investigating all comes back to the amber which we have seen before that is used to plug holes in the space-time fabric that is going to rip the universes apart and the unsettling thing is that anyone within that quarantine zone gets trapped in the amber and what the public believes is that when that happens you die you are trapped in amber and you are dead what we actually know to be the case is that you are actually in suspended animation and not dead and this episode shows that explicitly because at the early on in the episode we see two guys cutting into the amber trying to do something And we realize they're actually trying to free a person from the Amber. And then we find out that it's a person who looks exactly like one of the people that we're hanging out with. And so this brother is releasing his brother from the Amber who has been trapped for five years in this suspended animated state. And when the guy comes back to life, there's a whole element of mirroring, mirroring something that we've been talking a lot about. There's a whole element of Who is who? Which twin is which? Which brother is which? Who's pretending to be what? So I like a lot of the parallels that are going on with these brothers, Joshua and Matthew Rose, within the mystery of the week, echo a lot of our Olivia, faux Olivia stuff, while at the same time, Walternet and Brandon at Massive Dynamic, along with Broyles, start to ramp up what their actual plan is for Olivia in this episode. I really like now that we are sort of in the, you know, civilization part of the fringe storyline that we are not seeing people do bad shit because they can and they're talented enough. This brother who who is a who is a criminal ends up robbing a bank and because of his actions, his his twin, who is a good man, gets stuck in this amber, and that should, sort of kicks off this whole situation. I thought it was going to take a little bit longer for our Olivia to really figure out who she was. And I was really looking forward to seeing Anator really be semi 
tortured to death because of all the uh, examinations I thought that she was going to go through. But the way that they did it, I thought was really interesting because a part of our Olivia's subconscious masquerading as Peter kept popping up throughout this episode and kept saying, something is not right. You know, this is not true. Something is not right. So I thought that those images really served as a stepping stone for her to, to finally figure out that she is not the Olivia that she's being told that she is, that she's a, another Olivia from another universe. The almost end of this episode where Olivia jumps to a gift shop in our on, on our side and makes a phone call and discovers that one of her family members is alive. And that's the proof that she needs to understand that she has been taken captive from the other side. And I'm really interested to see how she is going to lie to Walter Nett, Brandon, and everybody over there. But like I've said before, I'm really interested to see how she's going to get back to our side and how she's going to escape and who she's going to bring in on it if she's able to. Yeah, that's a lot of the questions that we have with this. And I do like the device of her visions of Peter trying to bring out our Olivia back and let her sort of push these fake memories aside, which has shadows of season one where she would see John. So I think that it's not something that has never happened to our Olivia Dunham before, where she's seeing someone who's not there. So I thought that was really interesting. And to bring that back, but also to have her in these tests start to be able to cross over. And that first time she crosses over into the gift shop, she's just there for a moment and she scares the living shit out of a kid who's going to get blamed for the destruction that she did of the snow globes. So RIP that kid's social life, because I'm sure they're grounded forever. But uh, then she goes back and she says like, oh yeah, I, I crossed over. And the second time that she ends up crossing over is when now she is starting to be more suspicious of what Walternet is up to. And she does basically pull this number out of her mind and she gets to that phone and calls Ella. And when Ella answers, she realizes that this is real. This is not some sort of made up imaginary thing because this is a real phone number and she really got in touch with Ella. So these are not fake phantom memories that she's got. This might be something more. And so then when she comes back, she says, nothing happened. I didn't go anywhere. Sorry, guys. Like the test was a bust this time. And I thought, okay, we're finally, hopefully shifting. Now, last last week we talked about when full Olivia's memories completely took over. Now our Olivia is fighting back and is seeing some of the light in the darkness. And she knows not to trust the people she is around. And so when she lies at the end, we know finally we're going to maybe be able to move forward. But I also think it's interesting that the way we see Team Fringe handle this Amber mystery it starts to make us wonder if our Olivia brought the truth to Charlie and Lincoln, they, they might not be enemies immediately. We might have some allies on that fringe team if they knew what was actually up. So I thought the more time that we have spent with alternate fringe team, I'm starting to feel like even though we immediately hate, we want to hate everyone because they're on that side. I'm starting to think, not everyone would be on the bad side if they knew what was happening. And that's an interesting dynamic. And a lot of that is revealed through the discussions they have around the brothers and the Amber thing. But it's starting to show that I think there's some cracks that our Olivia can exploit to get some help while on that side. And we are led to believe that that fringe team is evil because of Walter and because of what his agenda has been pushing in what he has said to his people. But I believe that if Olivia trusts, uh, trusts Charlie, trusts Lincoln and trusts alternate worlds enough that I believe that these individuals will help her while our Olivia is investigating this case over there. She sort of has to prove to Broyles that she is killed, that she is capable and that she can be trusted. The final interaction 
with Broyles and our Olivia, where Broyles apologizes to Dunham for being the for for being the one that sort of floated the idea that these two brothers switch places at some point in the episode. And if Olivia didn't go down into, I guess, the subway system to sort of, uh, you know, crack this case open, maybe this case would have been unsolved in uh, over there. Or maybe uh, way more people would have died because of the uh, resulting amber explosion. So even though Olivia is in a captive situation, she's still a caring person. And she does things in this episode that I believe their Olivia or full Olivia wouldn't have done. So I really, really appreciate that, that she is, that she is still trying to get out, but she is endearing herself to the opposite fringe team. Yeah, she is. And I do think you're right that what we know of faux Olivia is that she's not as dedicated or as compassionate as our Olivia. So I think that we're seeing our Olivia go to lengths that their Olivia might not go to. And that is maybe throwing up some flags for the other fringe team where they're like, whoa, Liv is is on one right now. What's going on? So I thought that was also kind of interesting. And the the whole fact that they have to sort this brother thing out, because if they were to go public and the public were to find out that when you get trapped in Amber, you're actually trapped in Amber. This is a big lie that Walternet has told from the beginning and it would almost topple the government if they knew the truth, because a lot of people just accept it because they don't know the ramifications of what actually happens to you. So I thought seeing that and even seeing Walternet kind of be a little bit remorseful for a second about like, yeah, like we told this lie, but it's for the greater good. And if people knew, then shit would hit the fan. I just start to wonder all of this good and evil and whatever. There's a lot of shades of gray going on with everybody that we're meeting here. And when push comes to shove further down the road, we'll have to see where the chips actually lie. And I'm, I'm excited to see what's going on. I'm hoping, and I, I just don't remember because it's been so long since I've watched Fringe, it's literally a, since it aired, probably. You know, I watched it when I bought the Blu-rays, but then I haven't seen this in 12 years. I don't know how much longer we can keep doing these back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. I'm kind of longing for like a little bit of cross cutting where we're going to get some of both sides on each episode. So I'm interested to see how long they keep up that delineation because I start to miss our characters when we're always on the other side for the full 45 minutes and vice versa. But maybe absence makes the heart grow fonder. I'm beginning to sense a little flirtation between Lincoln and our Olivia. So I'm very, very interested to see where that is going to lead and what sort of romantic entanglements that what what romantic entanglements that may lead to once Lincoln knows the truth and what he does with it is going to be very, very interesting to move to your point. I do think that in a couple of weeks, we're going to see more intercutting between their universe and our universe. So uh, you can rest easy in that we won't get that delineation between an episode here and in an episode there. Guys, I think that'll do it for this week's edition of Radio 815. If you guys like anything that we do here and you want to reach out to us and tell us uh, anything at all, there are a couple of ways that you can do that. Uh, first, you can just simply reach out to us by using the hashtag Radio 815 on Twitter, or you can reach out to us on our personal Twitter account. It's JJUniverse815. Uh, if you want to reach out to me personally, I'm also on Twitter. I'm at CreekFanatic88. But Matt, if the good folks at home want to talk to you about anything at all, what would be the best place for them to do that? On Twitter, at Matt Crandall. Until next week, as always, we'll talk back soon. Radio 815 is a Balloonhead Productions presentation in association with Killer Newt Productions.